you've actually had a unique situation where you have worked for a job that did not allow for 40 hour work weeks that actually had You're less right. working hours in a work week. And I would love for you to talk about what does that do? Because one might think, Bjorn, you can't get as much work done in a short work week as you can in a full 40 hour work. No. All right. What's happening, Bjorn? Welcome back. I love reading, if you can call it that, the audiobooks. And you picked the audiobook for this month. And it was actually a referral for yeah, you. Was, and we were talking one evening and my wife said, hey, I just heard about a book that I think you would really enjoy. We homeschool our kids. And so she listens to some homeschool things, different podcasts, different books, audiobooks. And there was a woman on a podcast she listens to who just had said, I listened to this book. It was a life changer for me. And that is a pretty strong statement to make. And Emily, actually, my wife sent me that podcast and I listened to her talk about it. And it just sounded very intriguing. <clears throat> so I looked into it a little bit more and I saw, oh, it's a very well-known book. There were, I think, over a million copies sold. And I thought we should check it out for our listeners here because I think it comes at an interesting time in society, in our world with a lot of uncertainty. So I think we've teased it enough here <laughs> on what the book is. <laughs> we've teased it enough that we'll put a link in the description to the book, but that's <laughs> exactly. it for today. We're not going to tell you any more about it. So the book is called Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, which is probably a little bit countercultural, I think, because we think of more is better, bigger, better, more power, all that. And I think this is a really good book, especially if you're at like a certain life stage or career stage, because for me, I've been in the workforce a little longer than you, Bjorn, but you go through these phases. You have some intuition about what you think you should do to be effective and make a contribution. And there are some waves and you go through some learning. And if you read this book, I think it can help you move forward a little bit. So what I would love is maybe you could explain the idea of what essentialism yeah. is, because it's probably not a word yeah, I think a I lot think, of people use. I think that the way that he sets it up in the beginning of the book, which I think is the part where I could you know, resonate to some level about how people are feeling right now, like especially workers, he talks a lot about burnout. We've heard about this quiet quitting, resetting, whatever you want to call it. Great resignation terminology for it. But part of it has been burnout from people. So much stress. And obviously, if you were already feeling a lot of stress in your life, and then you add on to that the pandemic stress and the economic stress and relational stress and political stress, like it, it can really add up. And so he talked about some of the signs of that. He talked about frustration, tired, depressed, hyperactive, and then the reverse of that, the lack of effort. People are choosing for us, feeling trapped. And these are all things that I think we've heard people are feeling right now in our world. And so he starts there by setting it up and reminding people again of like how it always should have been. But if you can relate with me, like you've maybe gotten off track or been told like more is better or thinking that you can do more than you were ever meant to do. So his main point is that we were never meant to do everything. That's one of the foundations of the book. You're never meant to do everything. And the main tagline, I would say, of the entire book was discerning the trivial many from the vital few. He says that all the time. I had to write it down and look at it a few times to really start to learn what he meant there. But if you apply this thinking to every decision you make in your life, and he's starting with work, but then he goes beyond that. His hypothesis is that in order to do this well, it's got to be a part of your entire life. You have to think differently about how you approach it. And we've always heard less is better. That's another just like buzz line that people say that you can choose what you work on, working smarter, not harder. And just these buzzwords that I think we throw out there, but he really puts meat to the bones on how important it is to focus your efforts on the key things that you are good at, that you're different in, and that use your skills and really your contribution, like you said, to society. 
in a way that is unique. And it's hard to do this because it feels good for a lot of us when we get asked to do more things, because usually if you have success, you get asked to do more things. And the challenge is figuring out, like you said, discerning the trivial many from the vital few. So where are you vital? Where are you vitally important? And then what can you do for the other things? Because you may not be able to say yes to whatever you want and no to whatever you want, but you could explore other ways of getting those things done if those are not within the vital few. So he talks about how essentialism is really not trying to do everything, trying to do a few things really well. And we know that companies that have succeeded, that are still the top companies that we would all list, they're known for something. They're known for maybe just one thing, or maybe a couple things. It's very few things and they just have done it super well and better than everybody else. And so just if we apply that to our own lives, what are the things that we want to be known for? What are the things that either we want to be known for or that our skills are best aligned to? And his argument is that once you want to be remembered for one huge thing that you did in your life versus a lot of teeny little things that nobody remembers, that that's just like a <clears throat> personal, a selfish way of looking at it. But I think the takeaway though is so good because if you try to do everything, you're joking yourself. The fact that people think they can say yes to everything and do it all really well, at some point you are not able to do it because you're not building in the margin that you have to have both to recover, to be creative, and I think to handle the unexpected, which is expected. Like we know that in personal finance, like it, it's gonna come. So if you're running at 100% of you're spending every dollar you have and an unforeseen things happens, you're going to have to figure out how to pay for that. Whereas if you ran at 90%, you could absorb a, a little bit of that unexpected and you would have been actually smarter because you planned ahead. You didn't know what it was going to be, <clears throat> but you planned ahead and were able to prepare for that. You, you bring up some interesting points here. And I want to ask you, because it sounds a little bit like essentialism is saying no to the things that aren't super important, focusing on what's important, but isn't there a temptation then if you say no to the things that maybe aren't super important to whatever task or job or business you're running, what if you find yourself only working at not just 90% capacity, but 50% capacity? Is that okay? Or should I take some time and figure out what I can do with that other time and be busy with that too? Or is it okay to just not necessarily be yeah. fully I mean, utilized? It probably depends a little bit on what areas we're talking about in life. If we're thinking mainly work here. One thing that I thought he brought up just to, that'll help answer what you're asking here that I, he talked about like the four burner stove, family, friends, health, and work as the areas. And it was just a good analogy. And he said, it does this decision-making, like this way of living does require trade-offs. And so he said, what if I told you that you had to turn off or cut off the gas, let's say it's a gas stove, to, to one of those areas, family, friends, health, work. <laughs> you have to turn off one so you can do the other three. What would you choose? Now he said, what if I told you had to cut off or turn off two of those to be really successful? Which would you choose? And so it's super hard to know how to operate. And so I think it could happen that you do end up getting to a lower capacity or production or whatever. But I do think that part of the way around that is to figure out the other areas of life where you might be able to turn up <laughs> how much you're doing in those spaces. I'm not sure if you were talking about total like capacity in all of life or just fit, focusing mainly on work. We're only human, right? Like we can only handle so much. And like, I do think his four areas are probably a pretty good estimate of the four main areas of our life. And yeah, I mean, I think if you're bringing down one of them, like that, that can allow you to invest in some other areas. It's less of like a hundred percent pie. And if you have a family, if you have friends, you know, like most of us do, so those will always be there. And even if one ramps down a little bit, like you could then therefore reinvest that energy into some other areas. And this is the space we're in, right? Like it's well-being, it's balance. Like we're trying to help people find it through finances mainly. This book almost goes a step above it and looks at areas of life and how you operate your entire decision-making process and really challenges you to do less things. Like just focus on a few things and just really go deep on those. And I think if most of us were honest, we would say we do too many things. I agree with you. First of all, 
The four burner analogy is interesting. And since I don't have any friends, I <laughs> can cut that one out right away. My health is going, so I only have really two burners. I think it's interesting because, especially like for people who are at the beginning of their career, I didn't have a family. I had some friends, but I really had work. And even as I came out of college, I had my health. And so you pour yourself into some of these things. So work for me was probably 80% of what I did. It just was my identity at the time. Now that has really changed over the years because for me, I wanted to have more free time. I wanted to have a family and things like this. And I see some of my friends that, you know, don't, right? They have excelled in their career and maybe are still single and people make their own choices. Maybe some people have some regrets. I probably have regrets about maybe not finding that balance a little earlier. Life is life, right? Nothing happens maybe exactly the way we plan. But what I think is interesting about this to me, and tell me if you disagree, is you read this book and it makes sense. I think it just makes a lot of logical sense. I think especially when we're very busy, who do we have to blame for that but ourselves? For me, when he talks about saying no strategically to turn people down, I think there's like this irrational fear for a lot of people that think, if I say no, they're going to hate me. Or if I say no, I'm never going to be asked to go on that vacation again. Or if I say no to that project at work, they're going to see me not as a team player or whatever, right? And saying no can actually help people see your worth, that you don't provide value just by trading your time for money, especially as you start selling in your career or becoming a leader in your community or whatever, right? Because a lot of the times your value is the ideas and the experience that you bring. And we've talked about Headspace in the last few months because I'm actually a big believer in that, especially when you start getting into work that requires creativity. It is very hard, nigh impossible to be creative, to be receptive to the inspiration of ideas when you are just mired in details and busy work. And I think you actually had an opportunity while you were at a conference to go and have some quiet time by yourself and just think. And you tell me, was that helpful as you think about where does the program want to go and what's going to help people and what are new creative ways that we can help people find ideas that might improve yeah, their finances? I think you're right on. I think that the tendency is to, for me too, right? I struggle with this too, that if I'm not busy, then what value am I bringing? And that busyness equals value. And I think depending on the type of the work, like you said, and I think the type of the role that you, your work is going to look different. And I think part of it, like at a leadership level, I do think space is extremely important part. It's the whole hybrid work arrangement, right? Like many of us have had to work remotely, work from home. And I think for a lot of people, the calculus was I'm way more productive at home because I save the commute time. I go right to my the room that I'm working out of. I can get all these things done. I can hop from one meeting to the next. I don't need to walk there. And that is all true. If you're thinking about the math one for one, like that's all true. What I would argue is that I think part of your work <laughs> is to build relationships with people and have collaboration with your coworkers. And you can do that somewhat virtually. But what you miss are the opportunities just to have other conversations throughout the day, unless you schedule that. And because of the virtual arrangement, it's like we've had to almost like schedule that time, which makes it feel formal, even if it is informal. And so it's the same thing where that type of work, I think it's still part of your work, everybody's work. If you're in that kind of job, I think that still should be viewed as work, even if you're not actually like executing tasks on a computer, if that's the kind of work that you do. So in the same vein, if you're tasked with strategic vision, leadership, creativity, you're using your mind to come up with the new, whatever it is, yeah, you have to have space. And you can get that by taking time off. Like in, my, in that example, like I was at a conference in D.C., I had a couple hours to kill before I went to the airport because the conference was over and I was waiting to go to the airport. And I happened to be able to walk down to the, the National Mall and just walk for a couple hours amongst the monuments there. And yeah, it was just an amazingly peaceful time. I hadn't really planned it actually. So it, maybe that was part of it is that it was just unplanned opportunity, but it, it got me away from it. And honestly, sometimes either being unplanned or surprisingly given the chance to have that time away is extremely helpful because you have to maybe physically get yourself away from where the tasks are, which in, a lot of our cases is our computer. So 
if you can get away, go for a walk, this could be done almost daily too. And it can be combined with some other things. If you need to exercise, you can go walk at lunchtime, get away from your desk. It is very important. I don't think we realize how important it is until you don't do it for a long time. And then all of a sudden you start to realize that like you are just only thinking like in tasks and you're kind of losing the forest from the trees a little bit as the analogy goes. So I, I love that he talked about that. And I think per your last question too, he did talk a little bit about exploring a variety of options before selecting the few like that actually is pretty good work to do. And I think in my own life, I've had some great trusted people around me that have helped me do this because sometimes you can do it, you know, yourself, but it can be helpful for people that are outside of the situations to help you think through options. Because if we just use work as an example, if you do great work, you're going to get more opportunities and they're almost always going to be great opportunities. You know what I mean? They're not usually going to be bad options. And so that's what makes it even harder is that it's not just amount of opportunities. It's like, they're all good. And you could explain all of them in terms of ROI. So you have to get some help sometimes from a trusted leader, a trusted coworker, maybe both. In my case, I was making some decisions about my role at our church and I had a trusted friend just help me think through like, where are you most vital? These other areas can be done by other people, but this area, there are very few people and you're on that list. So that's what I think actually can help anybody, no matter where they're at in their career. Even if you're just starting off, this is a super good exercise to go through. Let's just say that there are lots of different jobs you could do, but what you can do is you can ask people around you. And I actually had to do this in one of my classes in my graduate school program called like your best self exercise. And basically I asked about 15 people around me. It's an awkward thing to ask, but I asked them, what are things that you see about me that I'm really good at. It's a weird thing to ask. It's a weird thing to receive, but it's so helpful because you start to see themes, right? You start to see like all these people across my whole life and all different areas have identified like these three things or five things or whatever it is. And they all said it. And that's like your differentiator as a person. And then I've actually coached other people trying to make a career change or entering the job market. I've said they should do this because then imagine if you knew that you could then look at every single opportunity and line up your skills with that job and try to find the closest fit. It won't be perfect. It won't always work exactly like you think, but it's exactly this process. It's like figuring out what are you really good at and different on, and you should be doing those things as, as closely and as possible as it is to make it happen. So I love that he talked about that, that thinking through and selecting a few things was actually a worthy use of your time because you can do some analysis before you jump in and try to figure it out on the job. You can do some assessment beforehand. Yeah, and I like the idea of that. This is gonna be evolving, living, breathing, especially depending on where you're at. And if you have capacity, you can take on more stuff and try. I think one of the things that might be tempting after reading something like this is to just go out and start pruning things in your life. And you could do that too, depending on where you're at. But one of the things that I remember with like financial advising is that you would take the clients that you could get. That's how you started your business. And as you got bigger clients or clients that had deeper, better relationships with you and you hit your capacity because there's only a certain number of clients that anyone can manage, whether it's financial services or banking or technology or whatever. And then you would start to have to decide who are you going to work with for whatever reason. It's not just necessarily money or account size or any of that, but let's say you can only manage 200 families or 300 families. When you get that 301st customer, you're going to have to figure out where does the other customer go? What is that going to displace? And if you are tempted to say, I don't want to lose anyone, I'm just going to take them on. Like you said, now you're at 101% capacity. That's yeah. going to burn you out pretty quick. People think you can handle that. Some people love to think that they love working and that usually comes to a head at some point. But if you are bringing in new stuff and not doing the exercise of figuring out what you're going to release, and it doesn't mean that you're going to abandon anyone, the normal process in financial advising is to bring on an associate who can continue to work with 
some of these other people to grow and like you said, outsource, take the stuff off your plate. As you said, if you're cutting out some stuff, focusing on the stuff you're good at, those tasks don't disappear, but you've got to find someone who can partner up with them and say, Hey, that's what I want to do. And we've talked at some length before about outsourcing. And I've been a big fan of that and using people overseas and finding people who really love doing the stuff that you don't love to do. And that's a great partnership. And it just like even me and you working together, right? And you like doing some of these things and I like doing some of these things. So I feel like productivity wise, we've been a good pair. On the other hand, like you said earlier, I think some of our best work has come from informal collaboration. When we've just grabbed a conference room and a whiteboard or spun chairs around from our desk and just talked for hours about ideas or what problems we were seeing and coming up with things to throw against the wall and start crossing stuff out and start bubbling some stuff up. And that just doesn't happen necessarily by scheduling it. It doesn't necessarily happen until there are certain inputs that spark your imagination about things, which is actually why I love reading some of these books because these aren't necessarily finance books per se, but isn't finance just yeah. the common denominator to all this, right? Money from work is what you live on. And so figuring out how to be more effective at work, how to be more effective at home. That's why I think money is actually far more expansive than people give it credit for. It's not just interest rates and balancing a checkbook. So that's why I think this is so interesting because it depends on what you're struggling with. But if you think you are flirting with burnout, right? You're just exhausted, you're bored, you're stressed, whatever it might be. I think it's a great book to read to give yourself some practical ideas about where yeah. can I do some pruning, right? And if you're a gardener, someone with a green thumb, I am not. But if you are, I think the rule generally is that doing the right pruning will help a plant thrive as opposed to doing no pruning, which you might think would help a plant, but it really stifles their growth. And so doing the right pruning, giving yourself those outlets to be really expressive in your work or in your life or your relationships, that's great. And as you said, it's a balance. And I think that we all have this melody of life that we want to keep going and we have to figure out how loud yeah. are all the instruments in our lives and, and keep those in balance so that we have our own melody because if we go too much on any one thing, then we're going to be all trombone. And we know how those trombone <laughs> guys are all snare drums. It's just not as interesting. I really like it from that standpoint. I wanted to go down into the book a little bit more. I had another question. I want to ask you this. A few years ago, we watched a movie called yeah. The Minimalist mm -hmm. Leave. Yeah, that may right, not be right. the name of it. And I was thinking about minimalism. And I am not a minimalist, but minimalism with your possessions is somewhat similar to essentialism yeah. with your time, yeah. would you say? And what kind of analogies are there? What can we learn from minimalism and essentialism, whether it's possessions yeah, or think, time? Obviously, in order to live in a minimalist way, which <clears throat> is pretty self-explanatory. But when you watch this, I think it, it might still be on Netflix if people want to check it out. It may be obvious to everybody is you're living with barely anything. And you have one spoon, one chair, one bowl, or if there are two of you, you have two. So you share the <laughs> well, bowl. Um, you don't need it. Share the spoon, every other <laughs> bite. Hopefully you like each other. So it is similar. I think what that requires is that requires you asking hard questions of your self, of, of your life. So hard questions of your finances, hard questions of your time. But I think always keeping on your radar, why? I think that's the big question. Like, why would I ever want to do this? What's the point? Because if there's no good why in your life, of living as a minimalist, well, then it's going to be hard. It's like you're you're going to try to lose 25 pounds. It's you want to probably have a pretty good why because it's not going to be very fun after day four of that. You're going to be like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm going to go back to having gummy bears. I think having that answered, but then having the other questions right after that. Do I need to have this? What value is this bringing to my life or the people around me? Am I good at this in the time aspect. But in the financial aspect, this is not a bad time actually in our economic world to be doing some of this work. 
We don't know what's going to happen. It looks as though there's continues to be more uncertainty. I think it's possible there could be a recession. So I think it's usually never a bad time to ask these questions, but this is a great time because we don't know if it's going to happen, but it's not ever bad to just look at where your money's going. And it's a little bit more fun than actually thinking about doing a budget. It's a little more fun just to ask the bigger questions. Do we need to do X? Like in my family with four kids, do we need to go get coffee, go get donuts? These are things we like to do, but really being willing to put that on the table in front and ask the people that are part of that decision-making, <clears throat> members of your household, members who make money to, that, that come in, members who spend the money, to do a hard look at some of those line items, just to ask, do we have to do this? And even if you would answer yes immediately, being willing to maybe ask a few whys, like why is that a yes? Is it really providing value? And we call that here right-sizing your budget, like putting money toward the things that matter more and putting less money toward the things that matter less so that you get the highest ROI on your dollar spent. Some things you have to spend on, but I guess you could argue like those necessities are probably pretty high in ROI because you need to have a place to live. You need to have heat. You need to have cooling. You need to have water, some of those things. So to me, the connection is the question asking, like the ability to take a step back, which is all part of this too, is just like taking a step back, putting some things on the table and not assuming that it's going to be a yes to everything or that's going to continue the same way that it has. And this is actually what we do in coaching. We're almost like doing essentialism with them. That's why people love it so much. Because if you've never done this before, you've never actually taken a step back to look at where your money's going or even questioned it at all, but you felt the pains of doing some bad behaviors. That's where a coach can come in like my golf coach did the other night for me, by the way, and basically ask you, do you want to continue in this way? Most people who are reaching out to a coach say, no, I want to change. So there's an, a willingness. And then you say, okay, where, what do you want to be able to do? And you put that out there. And then you go backwards from that to say, okay, how can we get going in that direction? What are some areas of your spending in this case that Maybe you don't need to do, or you could do differently. You could replace things. You could spend less. You could shift it in other places. And so you are doing pruning. That's how most people view like budgeting. It's not a great word, but I like the idea of calling it budgeting essentialism <laughs> because you're just putting money toward the most important things in your life. You're investing in the places that are the best for you and those that are part of that financial household. And that to me is a worthwhile cause because that can help you cut out the fat, like really focusing on the healthier things and can actually help you grow even more or make your money go further in this case, and also help you absorb any unforeseen changes that might happen. Yeah. And uh, your golf coach has done great things with you. I think you're very happy. And for those of you that live in Minneapolis at 24 Golf Simulator, you can also take advantage of some great golf instruction there too. I would love to ask you, and I was thinking about this as you were talking, what are actual examples of places that maybe even before you read this book that you have been doing some essentialism yourself. And I'll kick us off here. One of the things that I was thinking about is when I had more time and space, I subscribed to a lot of like email newsletters, whether it's Financial Advisor or Market Insights, Market Watch, and just a ton of different stuff because I wanted to have like information coming to me, right? I wanted to be able to see what was happening. And I realized that after a while, you start getting busy, you start getting work email, other emails, those types of things. And all I was doing was just deleting them. And I realized what I should do is take a look. What are one, two, three that really have kind of unique insights that are challenging me or educating me and pair my subscriptions down to the ones that I'm actually going to get value out of instead of the 10, 15, 20 that I'm getting and then I just ignore them all. Right. And so I've done that. So I have one for general kind of broader news, one for financial news, one for well being news. And I like it because now I'm actually getting probably more information, and more ideas from fewer sources than I was before. So yep. well, that's just one way that essentialism that's has a really probably good affected point, my that, inbox. That you 
How about you? Like you actually could get more out of it. Like that, I think that's the misconception is like, how could you get more if you're getting less? Like how could you take away more? But if you think about it, if you're going just right below the surface on 15 different articles, let's just say in this case, like 15 different stories, you might like skim them or get one nugget out of all 15. But if you are looking at three and you're able to read five articles in each of those or whatever, let's just say, you might get three to five ideas out of that. And so you actually came out with more ideas of what's going on and, and you did the work, it sounds, to assess like which ones hit the camps or the categories that you need. Again, it's counterintuitive to how our world operates because we just think you just gotta do more is always better. And he's entering in and saying, no, not only is it an alternative way of thinking, but it's actually better for you. You were actually never meant to do more. Part of why we see such struggles that people have with attention span with their phones because we're always on them and we're always getting more. We have lost all of that space that we used to have to just be bored. I think he even maybe said it in the book, like, when was the last time you were ever bored? When I think of boring, I always think of the DMV. You take a ticket, there's a huge line, and you're just sitting there. And I remember in the past, I didn't have my phone, so I just was people watching. But you also had rest. There's like almost a level of rest in that, that now you go there, everybody's on their phone. Every single person, nobody's saying hi to anyone. No one wants to be there. And they're just filling themselves up with more things. And it's tempting, and I do it too, because it's right there. It can occupy your time. You think you're adding value to yourself, but you're actually not taking that time of rest that we probably always should have. So that's your life hack, everyone, <laughs> is to leave your phone at home and go to the DMV and just burn a few hours there doing a little self and there self are care of time, different right? Options for that. My my boredom time is going shopping with my wife. That's the one I hate, right? Let's, let me just go in here for a little while. And now I'm walking around in a store that has nothing that I want. And I am just counting the minutes to get out of there. I wanted to ask you this question when we're talking about practical ways to apply essentialism, because you've actually had a unique situation where you have worked for a job that did not allow for 40 hour work weeks that actually had You're less right. working hours in a work week. And I would love for you to talk about what does that do? Because one might think, Bjorn, you can't get as much work done in a short work week as you can in a full 40-hour work no, week, that's right? No, that's a good, really good point. I didn't even think about that example. So, yeah, I think at face value, you would look at that and say they're just not as productive or that's just an employee benefit, just a nice to have. So let's just look at all of life, right? <clears throat> and for those of us that work day jobs, we still have all of the other things that need to get done. Oil changes, car repairs, grocery store runs, getting our kids to and from a child care, all of these things, those are all still gonna be there. Whether you have a 40 hour job or a 36 hour job, or you go into the new model that people are trying like the four day, 10 hour thing, all those are still gonna be there. All the other things you have to do in life are still going to be there unless you outsource some of them, which is possible. That's another way you can accomplish this. But I remember when I was working in that, I would save those kind of periodic or one-off things that I could choose when they happened. I would always save them for that open time, that four hours on, I think it was, we had half day Friday. I, could, I always saved them for that little time slot. So I either had to do it and not work, or I had to go to get an oil change and then work in a different environment, which was a little less productive. So if it's just a comparison in that way, like I actually would argue that I got just as much, if not more work done because I knew that I had the time. I knew that I had that special time that was reserved to, to set aside for that. And yeah, it was just an interesting way of doing it. It also provided space, like we talked about on those Fridays. It was, of course, something that was looked forward to <clears throat> by everybody that worked there. I think if you're working eight hour days, five days a week, there can be a tendency anyways, I think, for some corporate type folks like on, on Fridays to just be looking forward to the weekend, maybe even leaving a little early on Fridays. No one's really going to start a project on Friday afternoon, probably. They might do some tasks kind of things, but like that might not be like the most productive time of the week, I would probably argue. But that space is not like the probably the highest ROI time space anyways. So if you give that to employees as a gift, as a well-being thing, 
And they can use that to do some of the other life tasks that are already going to be part of your life anyways. It was a pretty sweet kind of thing. And actually, I would argue that I was just as productive, if not more, because of the fact that I had that time reserved. Because if I'm doing an oil change, not only do I have to get the time slot, I have got to go through the work during the workday, because that's the only time they're open, to call, figure out a time, figure out the cost, where am I going, how am I going to get back from the place if I have to leave the car there. There's a lot of little things just in that one example. But think about all the other things that people have to do during the week, and they're having to fit that in to days where they're expected to be beyond and be productive. Yeah, it's a great point. And you can put those things at a time when it's not as busy, say on a weekend when everyone else is trying to do their grocery shopping or oil changes or book returns or whatever it might be. Do you also think that the shortened week forced those workers into yeah. somewhat of an essentialism mindset? Because you have less time, you can't take three meetings. And sometimes knowing that you don't have as many hours as other workers, you just have to be more efficient with the time yeah, you have. I, you know, I mean, what, what do you think about that? I think that? just because you, you literally have less hours to fit the stuff in. <laughs> so I do think you have to be a little bit more selective in that. I don't think that's the only way to accomplish that. Like, I think companies can have a culture of expecting you to not have a meeting before the meeting. And some cultures do it the opposite where they, it's like meetings all the time. And that's just the only way you get stuff done. But I think it helped. I think for sure it helped. And I think that's what we're seeing with this four day, 10 hour work week is that exact model. It's probably a nice balance because it's hard probably for a company to shift down. I would be curious to know what that former company, when they made that change, like what was that like? Was it done over time or done right away? Or how did they approach that? Just because the mindset of all the people that had put in all the years working 40 hours, I suppose nobody's going to complain too much about having a 36 hour job. And then of course the question is, will I only get paid for 36 hours or what happens to hourly workers? Do they only get paid for 36 hours? So that's all part of it. It does force that a little bit more in kind of the model that you create. So you got to try to fit it in to these time slots and it, it would force you to have to do less meetings probably. Let me ask you this. From a practical sense, FOMO, fear of missing out. Don't you worry if you're going to say no to stuff and your buddy is like, hey, Bjorn, do you want to go golfing? Hey, Bjorn, does your family want to come over for dinner and a movie night? Hey, Bjorn, could you volunteer for this committee? Could you get involved in this in the community? Or how about this special project at work? Do you think that we're going to miss out on something like that fear, this FOMO is driving this anti-essentialism yeah, type of behavior. Yeah, so you're preaching to the FOMO king here. I have some kids that suffer from their father's FOMO sickness. Mm. So I have struggled with this my whole life, for sure. It definitely is there. And it's hard in a lot of areas. I think it's really hard at work because like, people get rewarded often for taking on more things, being a good team player, saying yes to more things. So that's tough because the rewards at times are there for that. Not always the really good quality work or creative work. It's more about a number of things that you do. In my own life, it's for sure a struggle. So I think two things that I've had to do to, like, practically address this. Number one is have a great wife who isn't like me that kind of challenges saying yes to things, that's been really helpful. And throughout our whole marriage, she has been an amazing coach for me because when we first were married, I really struggled with this. I would get like emotional about not saying yes to things. I'd be like, oh my gosh, but I'm going to miss that and I'm going to miss out on that. And it's just helpful to have someone that was a little bit more introverted and didn't need to say yes to everything to help me think through that. So that is one way. Another thing is believing in the things that you do say yes to. It's not just cutting out things, but you have to like be excited about the things that you are saying yes to or believe in the things that you are saying yes to. But the best example I can think of is I serve on the finance team of my church, right? and believe that there are not a ton of people at our church who can do this kind of work. <clears throat> and But there are other things that a lot of people can do. And so in that example I mentioned a little bit earlier, I was looking at doing two things and realized that I really can't do them both well. And I had to choose one or the other. And so I just needed some help from someone to say, okay, finance work, you're better at that. There's not as many people to do that. I would do that over doing this a kids ministry that like you would also be 
fine at, but there's lots of people that can do that. So it's hard to say no. It for sure is. But I strongly believe that if you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else. Because in most of our lives, especially in the society we live in, almost all of us have way more options of things we could do than ever in history and way more options that we can actually do in our life that we could actually execute and do well. So I have to know that if I say yes to another sport, yes to another committee, yes to another work, whatever, that's potentially me saying no to my family, no to my friends, no to my my space to go do something fun. You know what I mean? No to the unknown thing that might be asked that I don't even know is coming. But I because I said yes to this, I have to now say no to this awesome opportunity I just got that could have been even better. Yeah, it's for sure a struggle. I think what makes it hard is technology. The fact that we know about everything now, everything around us we can find and know and see tons of different great options. And it's awesome to know all that. But if you aren't able to make good decisions about that, like you could totally just burn yourself out super fast in your life. So I've had to learn it over time. I'm still learning it. And it's particularly hard when you're rewarded for saying yes to things. That's what makes it super hard because then you feel like you're almost saying, I don't want the rewards. I'm willing to not take the rewards. But that's when you have to then really believe in the other thing because it may not have the same reward. It may not be like a actual money award. Let's just say it's being on the road for your job when you don't like necessarily have to be, but if you did that, you'd get all these opportunities and all this kind of stuff. And for some people, that is what they're going to do. And they choose that and it can be really great. But then you're going to sacrifice time with your loved ones, right? And so you're not going to get paid for the time with your loved ones. You're not going to get more financial reward, but you might get relational reward, fun reward, kids trust reward. Those are hard to match up and compare to each other. This book gives you a framework, but it's not perfect. It's pretty hard to figure it out. And that's where you need good counselors around you to help you think through things before you make a final decision. And if you suffer from FOMO, don't forget to check out the LMY store where you can pick up <laughs> Famoxicillin 50 milligrams to help guarantee reduce your FOMO by 30%. That'd be a That'd be a moneymaker. I think your comment about technology is right on. I actually have a friend who deleted all her social media profiles a couple of years ago. If you ask her, like, what, I don't see you on Instagram anymore. She'll say, yep, two years, social media free. And she just talks about how she's impressionable and suffers from FOMO and is more of a follower than a leader in some ways. And it can just be really hard when you see things constantly and you feel like, oh, I didn't get invited or I'm not doing that or I'm not as successful or whatever it might be. Now, the irony of it is there are some people who have such bad FOMO that because she's not on there, they're obsessed with what is she doing? Because I don't know. Maybe she's doing something really awesome and not sharing it with the world. There can be a little bit of a catch-22 there, too. But I think all of these things are really important, especially for people who are feeling burned out, overworked. And I would love to ask you a final thought here. In the financial well-being world, what can we take away from essentialism that will help our well-being overall? Yeah, I think FOMO usually means spending more money. <laughs> Because usually things cost money. I like what he says. He says, where can you make the highest possible contribution? And what do you feel deeply inspired by? You've got to really believe in the things that you're choosing to do. But ultimately, like you're choosing out of the great options out there where to focus. And financially, most of us have a certain amount of money that is available for us to choose from, if you will, on how we spend it. I just think of the day-to-day -day finances. This is a perfect way to approach your day-to-day -day finances because it, it's about money, but it's really not about money. It's really about choosing to do the things that matter to you is probably the best way of saying it. Maybe it can be the highest possible ROI or the highest differentiator for yourself, but focusing on less things and going deeper with those things, like even in the heart of giving, right? If you give to different organizations or different people, you can make a bigger impact, obviously, if you just focus on just a couple. And the cool part about doing that is that's more meaningful to them. And then you could like really get to know what are they doing. You might even be able to give your time to help that person or organization. And you can like really get invested 
and do that super well versus just scattering money to all these different places. And you're just like one of a many people that are giving in that way. I think it just can help you to think about your financial spending, think about your budget in kind of a new way. Look at all the line items, pare down to what is truly essential. And that actually can be a good exercise to, to go through. I don't need all these things. They don't add value to my life. Let's pare it down to the vital few. And that actually financially works out quite nicely for most people, unless you can only buy luxury cars, then it gets uh, tough. So they don't even make luxury cars, right? I totally agree with you. And I think all of that makes a lot of sense. And like I said money is a common denominator. One of the things that I really liked about this book is that I think it helps for those people who are making essentialism types of decisions to feel maybe not guilty, but less guilty about it. So one of the things that had come up fairly recently is a buddy of mine had asked if I could volunteer with this organization, a cause that I actually care about with adoptees and being an adoptee myself. I really do support as much action there. There are a lot of kids that are looking for homes. So if you're it's just becoming a foster family or something like that, I know that lots of organizations would welcome you into that. But I asked him how much time would that take? And he's like, well, there's a monthly meeting that lasts between two and three hours. And then there's usually some monthly committee work. So you're probably looking anywhere from six to nine hours a month in terms of a time commitment. And the reality is, as I looked at that, it doesn't sound like a lot. I don't have that time. I just don't have it between that and my hobbies and some of the other organizations that I'm already participating in and family. And I just really don't have it. In fact, I've tried to make accommodations in other areas of my life to give me some of that time back. And so I just didn't think it was fair to the organization to really do something where I was phoning it in. And part of me felt really guilty about that because here's an organization that would probably be happy with whatever you could spare in terms of time and effort. But it's also probably better for them, for me to step aside and make way for someone who has well, the motivation, but more importantly, the time and can put the effort towards the organization and their mission in a way that I can't. And so for a while, I felt guilty that I had to say, no, not now or not at this stage of my life or whatever. Reading this book helped me realize that it's okay, not to say that you always have to put yourself first, but you know, when people are asking you for things, yeah. they don't know if you're bored and have a lot of extra time or if you're super busy. So you have to be the gatekeeper to your own life. And yes, I want to support that organization as much as possible. It helped me say, I don't have to feel as guilty about saying no, because it really was the right decision for me. And it's probably going to be the best yeah. decision for them as well. So that's what I really liked. It gave me a perspective that it's not always give right. beyond your capacity or until you're stressed out or mentally ill or worn out, burned out or any of that stuff. So if you want to invest not only in your financial well-being, like you were talking about, but also just your overall emotional well-being, I think there's a yeah. lot that you can take from essentialism. So I really enjoyed the book. I think it's definitely a book I would recommend for a lot of people. There's a little bit of humility in this whole process. Like you, you have to be willing to say, I can't do everything. Not everybody can say that. You have to honestly feel it. You can say a lot of stuff, but you have to honestly feel it. Like I can't do everything. Like in your case, like you couldn't do it to the level that they needed it. And so you had to be humble enough to just say, I, I can't, but you're just honest with what you can do if that's an option. One thing that I think would be good for our listeners and is an exercise that I have done a number of times is think about the 168 hours you have in your life every week and do a calculation. It's, it can be pretty simple. You should know this pretty well. Where does your time go? And I feel like I'm talking about budgeting. Where do you spend it? It's pretty shocking, at least for me. I was trying to find how much free time do I have available? <laughs> and then trying to figure like, can I have a hobby right now? Essentially, I think was part of what I was doing. And there's not much. You have to factor in sleep, eating, family time, work time. It's pretty crazy once you do that, but it's a super great exercise because you should know, you can look back, look get some help from somebody if you need to. You can store it, you can update it periodically, and that can help you see where it's all going into different categories and then help you figure out, do you need to think more essentially here? Are you doing too many things 
like you're being scatterbrained or could you focus more and do those things better? I agree. Said essentialism, I will put a link to it in the description below, but thanks again for joining us for another discussion. We'll see you next time.